In this video we're going to take a look at some of the challenges from the Hack the Box University Qualifiers 2021. Uh, you can see we've got a range of different categories here. We've got some web challenges, some pwn, some crypto, reversing, forensics, hardware, misc, skater, cloud. And we have this full pwn category as well which is like the Hack the Box machines. We can get user and root on three different machines. As you can see I've solved rel relatively few challenges so far. Um, the CTF is pretty difficult. I mean, the challenges, you've got like two, three solves on quite a lot of these challenges. I think some have probably yeah, one solve. Um, despite the fact we've got 2,363 players from nearly 600 teams. Uh, so I'm lagging quite far behind. Hopefully we'll catch up a little bit. Um, but I doubt I'm going to be able to get that many of the challenges done. Hopefully we'll get some nice walkthroughs from John Hammond or something to uh, catch up on what I miss. Uh, but let's take a look at some of the challenges. The first challenge we're going to take a look at is called Peel Back the Layers. It's a forensics challenge and the description says An unknown maintainer managed to push an update to one of our public docker images. Our SOC team reports suspicious traffic coming from some of our Steam factories ever since. The update got retracted making us unable to investigate further. We're concerned that this might refer to a supply chain attack. Could you investigate? And then we get the docker image name. So let's take a copy of this. We don't have any files or anything to download for this one. so. We'll need to go and investigate the Docker image. I'm very bad with Docker and any kind of containers, so whenever I come across challenges like this, I normally have to go and look for a Docker cheat sheet to try and just work out all the different commands that I can run. Um, so let's go and grab one. I don't want a PDF. Something on GitHub would be better. Uh, let's check this one out. Uh, I mean, we could just use the Docker manual and the help, but sometimes I find that these cheat sheets are put together a little bit better in terms of the commands and stuff we can run. Um, anyway, the first thing I want to do is pull the Docker image. So let me just mention, I don't know if anybody else has these problems, but with Para, I have a problem where I need to run this Docker fix every time I boot my operating system. Uh, I have an alias set for it just so that I can run docker underscore fix, and that will fix it. But let me just um, grab... Uh, docker from my bash aliases. So this is what I had to do to fix this. I just found this from the GitHub and I've had to do this for several months and there doesn't seem to be any solution that I'm aware of. So just in case anybody else has this problem as well, you can run this command to make your docker images work. Um, okay, so let's try and do docker pull and we're going to pull that image and let's run docker image ls we can see that we've got our image here we can use docker if you just run docker and then hit the tab you'll get a list of all the different commands that you can run here so um, as you can see there's quite a lot which is why if you're not really if you don't use docker too much cheat sheets can help a little bit uh, but let's do docker inspect and then we'll inspect the only image that we have there um, we can go and have a look through this information, but the first thing we should notice is that we have these layers. We have three layers, and the challenge description, well, the name of the challenge was Peel Back the Layers, and I think the description mentioned something about it as well. So that's certainly of interest, but let's try and run the container anyway. We'll do docker run dash it oh, uh, to make it interactive so we can jump into the shell. That's going to run. We're inside the shell. So the first thing I actually tried to do here was just see if I could grep out, like, hack the box from maybe it's somewhere in the file system. You can do dash i um, for case insensitive dash r. Let's um, send any permission denied errors to dev null. Uh, let's also, I think it's capital I, to ignore binary files. Uh, so you can run through that to try and basically search the entire file system just to see if we've got Hack the Box in one of the files. This didn't come back with anything for me, so let me just close that. I'm going to open up a new tab, and let's try and do Docker History. Run Docker History on the image, and we'll actually see some of the various changes that were made to it. But because it doesn't let us see everything, we can't see the full file names and stuff that have been added here, or the full commands. What we can also do is run docker history and then add no trunk so it's not truncated and then we'll just same again steam maintainer so that'll give us the full commands that are run uh, we can see that we have some files being copied for example so this was copied over to user share lib.so 
and then we have the LD preload being set here to that same file. So let's go ahead and see if we have these files available. Let's go over to our running Docker container. We'll try and CD in here and see if we have, let's CD lib. And we don't have the lib there. So this file is no longer available. So at this point I started looking for some solutions in terms of extracting layers from the Docker image. Uh, I found a GitHub tool here called Docker Layer Extract and if we just go and have a look at the instructions for this we'll need to let's see what we have here, docker save my image tag and then what we want to save it to in a tar file so let's try and do that. Let's do docker save and then the steam maintainer get repair image do dash o and save it to layers.tar try and run that and that's all looking good we need to go and download this as a git so let's grab that as well git clone and let's see what we need to do next so we run docker layer extract pass in the image file and then that's to extract the newest layer. Okay, we're not interested in the newest layer, we want to have a look at all of them. So let's do docker layer extract and then the image file dot tar and then list and that's going to list out the different images. So uh, docker layer extract, let's paste this in. The image file is dot dot slash layers dot tar and okay, let's see what we have here. We don't have a docker layer extract file. Did I need to install that somehow? have a look. Oh, I need to build it one second. You see, this is what happens whenever you solve a challenge and then try to make a write up the day later and you've completely forgotten what you did. Um, so we're going to do go build main.go and now we'll just run main, let's pass in that image file which was dot dot slash images oh, oh it was layers dot tar, sorry and we want a list. Try and run that, we get our three layers, so we've got the three different layers here which is looking good. Basically what I did was go and check out all of these layers. You can probably actually link it back to what we checked earlier in terms of the history to see where the file was, but I just checked each of the three layers. So if we go back to our documentation here, we can see we've got this docker layer extract image file and then we can just do extract and specify what we want to extract. We can also give the layer ID here, so I'm going to use layer ID. Let's go back, we'll run the same command again. Instead of list, we're going to do extract and we're going to pass in layer ID. Was there a dash in that? Layer ID, no there wasn't, okay. And then we just pick an ID. So let me grab this one first of all missing layer output file, let's do dash o layer okay, overwrite a file new layer let's see what we've got here, so we've got this new layer available to us now which is a tar archive so we'll do tar dash tf new layer I bet it's going to give me an error saying it needs to be, no okay I thought it was going to give me an error saying it needed the correct extension. Now notice that we don't have the file that we were looking for there. We do have this which we could extract and go and take a look at. Uh, we could do tar-xf and we'll say new and then we'll do sorry new layer and we'll do the we'll just say user. Let's see does that give us a user? Yep, cd user and then we have, okay, it's only given us a share there. Oh, it was a hidden file, was it? ls-lart, yeah, so we have this file now, so we can do file.whlib. It's actually empty, so maybe it's not empty in a previous version. Let me remove that user folder. And let's try another layer. So I've forgotten what the layers were called. Uh, list the layers. Let's do the second layer. Let's take a copy of the ID. Let's go and paste this in here. Let's 
new layer exists, let's do new layer 2. We're going to do the same thing again, we want to, well we just want to have a look here actually what's in there, so let's do tar-tf new layer 2 and this time we have this librs.so which is exactly what we're looking for. So let's try and extract this tar I'm just going to do tar xvf and extract all of this. I'm going to do new underscore layer 2. And now, if we go into our user directory, you can see we actually have our librs.so. So let's go and take a look at it. Let's go into share lib and have a look at the file. It's a binary, Linux binary, so that's all good. We could have a look at the strings in it, see if we can get an idea what's going on. Strings greater than 10, see if we've got any strings in here. Maybe it might just have a flag, which it doesn't look like it does. We could try to run it. Obviously, we should probably analyze it a bit more to see what it's actually doing before we do that. But um, yeah, segmentation fault. Um, so I opened it up in Gearder at this point, which I'm not going to do right now just because it takes a while for me to boot up Gearder. Let me open up GDB Pwn Debug instead. And let's have a look if we can disassemble it in this way. So um, we have some various functions here. I think if we disassemble con, if we disassemble the con, this is a bit it's a bit easier to look at in Geardra because we have the decompiled code as well as the assembly code. But if we have a look here, there's actually some hex values in the which are being moved as you can see into registers, RAX, RDX, etc. So we can go here and let's do unhex, paste that in. And if you look at this HTB, and then we have this curly brace. That's looking pretty good. Let's grab the second one and do the same thing again on hex. And again, it's in the reverse order, but it's looking pretty good. So, what I did here was just take this to Cyberchef and we can try to convert it from hex there. So, let's grab a copy of the first bit. Paste this in here. Let's so I'll go from hex so we can see it as it's going. You can see that in there, and let's grab the second bit. And the third one. Starting to come together. Obviously it's in reverse order here because of the endingness, so the bytes are in reverse order essentially. But if we paste all this in, this looks like our last one down here. Paste all that in. Now we need to fix the endianness. So you can do this in Cyberchef as well. We'll just go to swap endianness. And this is just like whenever we're doing buffer overflows, we go through and reverse the order of the bytes whenever we're dealing with addresses and stuff like that. At the moment it's set to word length 4, but we want to change this to 8. And there you see, hack the box, I really like steampunk, robot, and then some gibberish. The reason we have this gibberish is this last value is missing one digit basically so we need to pad it with a zero but we can't pad it with the, at the end because it's in reverse order so we want to pad it at the beginning so let's see where that D is you can see the D right here and I'm just gonna add a zero before the D and that's gonna retrieve the full password uh, another way you could have done that I think if let me let me close this down let me actually just cut this out cat uh, librs.so. You can actually see bits in here. So if you didn't sort out the padding on that final section, you could have actually grabbed the end of the flag just from running cat on that file. Um, but that's the first challenge done. The next challenge is called Strike Back. It's a forensics challenge, and the description says a fleet of steam blimps wait for the final signal from their commanders in order to attack Goggles Town Kingdom. A recent cyber attack has us thinking the enemy managed to discover our plans and prepare a counterattack. Will the fleet get ambushed? So we've got some files to download, I've already got those downloaded and we've got a PCAP file and a mini dump crash report with 17 streams. So we could have a look, I was interested in this um, free steam dump, I keep saying stream but it's steam. We could have a look in here for strings, maybe strings greater than 10, just to get rid of a bit of noise. And we can see immediately then we have this npatrick user and we can see some of the environment variables and things like that. 
didn't really see too much else of interest in here, so let's open up Wireshark. We'll open up the PCAP. So with the packet capture open, let's first of all have a look at the file properties. We'll see that the PCAP was it was captured for six minutes and thirty three seconds. We can see the date and stuff in case that's relevant. Maybe um, I mean this is a recent one, but if it was an old one, it might give you an indication of what kind of attack was happening at the time. You can also see we've got two hundred sixty one packets close that down and let's go back into statistics and protocol hierarchy just get an idea what kind of data we actually have in here so we've got mostly well mostly it's all TCP but we've got 11.5 percent here of uh, HTTP let's have a look actually here at the data though so just right click that and select select it we can go through we have some post requests here to the same ID each time but we can see that there are some different requests. We could go and follow those HTTP streams and see what's actually going. So we can see it's application data being sent. Uh, if we exit the filter, go to File and Export Objects, HTTP, you'll see also we have a lot of files here. We've got this free steam.exe which would be interesting to take a look at. We've got um, some other things here. Let's uh, let's save these all to a new directory. Uh, did that save them all? Let's have a look. Yeah, we've got them all downloaded, so we can run file and see what sort of data we're looking at. We've got this executable file. So now we might want to have a look at that and see if there's anything of interest. I mean, any of the streams should have also showed up whenever we ch checked that earlier. But you might want to take it over to Windows and have a look in a debugger or something like that. The first thing I actually did here was upload this to VirusTotal to see whether it would come back with anything interesting. And if we upload it here, we'll see we get 49 out of 65 detect this as malicious. And you see the first result there is Cobalt Strike. You see quite a few of those as well going through it. The same here in Community, we can see Cobalt Strike, Hack Tool, Analysis Report, etc. So, uh, oops. If we search for Cobalt Strike, for anybody just in, who isn't aware, this is basically a tool which is available that says threat emulation software. It's good for red teaming and has quite advanced kind of set up for post exploitation with command and control centers and um, it seems to be a very user friendly way of um, setting up these covert channels um, so in this case we'd be interested to see how this is actually working and what what uh, what we can do with the data I went down quite a few rabbit holes and I was trying to solve this challenge so let me give you an example of a couple we have this mini dump explorer which I tried to use on Windows because obviously we had the um, freesteam.dump which was the mini dump crash report uh, I did manage to get this tool up and running but I didn't find anything of interest in any of those sections in it um, I was also looking to see whether we could use something like radar so if we do radar uh, dot dot slash free dump, uh, freesteam.dump AA to analyze AFL we can see the functions we can select some functions here do like S FCN check each one, do PDF to disassemble it and we can go and start having a look through some of this data, we can have a look through our sections as well and I did actually go through quite a few of these sections just kind of looking looking around, didn't didn't find much of interest but didn't exactly know what I was looking for although I did come across some uh, let me open up this article I came across an article about understanding the Cobalt Strike payloads and in it, it kind of talks about decrypting some payloads in there. And one thing I did notice here was the payload header x86 variant. And it gives you an example of the signature, which I actually thought was matching here. You see we have our CLD, and it's FC4883, um, FC E8, but instead of 43, we have 05. Uh, so I kind of played around this for a little while, but it didn't get me towards the solution so let me kind of jump over to well actually just before we jump over to what did work for me 
obviously if you go to this article this will give you a good bit of information about how the payloads work and the command and control center works and what sort of indicators there are I think the as far as I could tell there's a free and a paid version and it will use different kinds of encryption for the payloads depending on what you're using so either XOR maybe or AES depending uh, I'm not too sure, I don't have too much experience with Cobalt Strike to be honest. Uh, but I think if we scroll down towards the bottom of this, we have this, uh, you can find our raw payload decoder and extractor for the most common encodings. It uses a parser from previous chapters to save your manual work. So we could download this and, in fact I did download this, I downloaded the, where's the payload tools? So we have this payload extractor, payload parser. Let me, I'll download them. Just kind of demo, might as well show the rabbit holes I went down. Maybe some of these could have worked, maybe I wasn't using them properly, let's see. Uh, let's W get this one. And the same with the parser. and then let's see what the instructions are so we can just run all right python parser and then pass in the mem dump so python cs parser i'm going to do dot dot slash dot dot slash free dump oh no wait too many uh pattern not found okay let me try that again with the Uh, capture. Nothing either. Okay. It did come back with some stuff last time. I'm pretty sure. Let me see. Maybe it's something. Maybe it was something in this files folder that I used instead. I'll try free Steam. No. Okay. Oh, actually, my mistake. I think it was the CS payload extractor. Use that with the free Steam dump. And yeah. All right. So it does show XORD beacon, and then it comes back with this uh, payload which it dumped. I didn't find anything to do with it from there, so all right, that's enough for the rabbit holes. Let's jump over to the resources which actually, which actually helped me get this sorted. Um, so I found this by Didier Stevens, probably pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, but it, for the last forensics challenge we did, or the reverse challenge with the PowerPoint, they also create the tool, the OLE VBA and VBA3, I believe, and quite a lot of um, OLE based tools for looking at malware and they basically describe here in the article um, that they've been looking, they mentioned that they've been looking at several different samples of cobalt stripe beacons used in malware attacks so essentially what we're looking at here is we're looking at the communications between the command and control server of cobalt and the uh, malware which is actually sending off the beacons or responding to them and uh, as they mentioned here if the Pro version was used, the paid version, it would be using AES to encrypt HTTP traffic or communicating over HTTP and encrypting the data with AES. Otherwise, they'll uh, presumably the other one is the XOR. Um, so they go through some the process here of getting the dump, which I guess we already have. And they mention that they have this file, the CS extract key.py. So um, I basically kind of followed along with this. Let's w get the extract key. I also tried some other stuff, by the way. There's like a um, there's like a Python extension for Cobalt Strike. I can't remember what it was called now. I can't remember, but it didn't work for me anyway. Probably due to me not knowing how to use it or set it up correctly. Uh, okay, so we download this anyway. Let's see what he's running. He tried to run Python extract CS extract key on the dump. Let's try that first of all. Python CS extract key on free steam dump. Um, okay, nothing happens. You can see then that they went to get a key from the C2. They went and grabbed this hex string and they passed that in with the dash C parameter. So 
let's go and take a look at the one of the post requests. I'm going to set this to HTTP. We'll go in here, we've got our data. Is that the first one? I'm going to get the first one. We've got our data. I'm going to right click and copy as hex stream. Let's try that again. But we'll do dash C, paste that in. We run through it, and now you see it's actually searching for AES keys and HMAC keys. It's going through, it's searching for all this, looking good. Notice that it's searching for a raw key, and it'll do that again here, and it doesn't actually find one. So, in his example, he does find a raw key, and then he uses another script that he created called parse HTTP traffic to actually decode the traffic. And he used the dash R, but we don't have that. So if we go and have a look at his code, you see that there are some different options available. One of the options was the raw key. Another one is this HMAC and AES key, which we do have. We were able to extract those two. So let's try and do the same thing, but instead of using a raw key, we'll use those values. Let's grab this script wget and we're going to do python cs parse http traffic let me actually just go back and see exactly what he did okay not much different so we're actually using a pcap this time we're going to decrypt the pcap and we're going to do dash k and did I just close that now I can't remember what order it was in dash k and it's the hmac followed by the aes separated by a colon so we've got our hmac right here i'm going to paste that in colon and then our aes key as well and then we want to give it our pcap file capture.pcap all right pip install pyshark run that again and this looks good it's run through a lot of stuff you can see it's actually pulled out this uh, PDF file file name download we've got a Excel spreadsheet as well we've got a document and we can go go and have a look through this data here we've got quite a bit of information including these hashes as well so we could actually grab these hashes And I'm going to go ahead and replace the new line using regex, so we're escaping the backslash there, replace all, uh, just to make it formatted a little bit better. And some of these values are the same, but let me try and take out the ones that are different. Oh, <laughs> that wasn't the different one. This one is different, and this one is different, and this one. So we could crack these with Hashcat or John the Ripper or something. I'm going to take it to CrackStation. I do have a CrackStation word list on my VM, but I don't think it's the full CrackStation word list that they use here. You can see they've got a 19 gig, 1.5 billion entry lookup table. Uh, oh, in fact, they actually have more than that. For MD5, they have 190 gig and 15 billion. Okay, it's probably going to take forever to bring up this option though. What I need to do as well in the meantime, let's go back to what we were just doing. We had some of those files to which were mentioned there and notice that we have this dash E option to extract files, extract the payload. So let's run this again and do dash E. And this time we've now extracted some of these files as well. Let's go back to CrackStation Correct station finds one of the passwords is Steam and one is being empty, but it doesn't find the admin password. Uh, but it's not important for us if we go back here and actually have a look at the files. We have our payload here, and it says confidential. If we have a look through it, we'll quickly find our flag. The next challenge is called Upgrades. It's a reversing challenge, and the description says. We received a strange advertisement via pneumatic tube and it claims to be able to do some amazing things but we suspect there's something strange in it. Can you uncover the truth? Uh, so we've got a file to download in this case. I've downloaded the folder. Let's go and take a look at it. 
and we have a PowerPoint 2007 plus document in here. Um, what I'm going to do is just go and open up a document which can help with some of these style challenges. Uh, so if you go to Hat Tricks, you can find a. There's actually not too much really in this cheat sheet in terms of what you can do with uh, malicious documents. You'll find some other tools and stuff elsewhere. You might wonder why I always this is the first thing I do whenever I come to these challenges. It's not necessarily that I can't remember what's in these references or cheat sheets or manuals. It's more just that I'm trying to show how I would approach these challenges if I didn't know what was, um, what how to approach it. You know, these are the kind of resources that you can go and have a look at. Um, for example, here this is telling us that we can use some different tools, the OLE tools. We can um, use what did it mention? There? Office Dissector as powerful analyst analyst framework, um, etc. So I'm not really going to go through this, but just I'm just opening it up to show this is a good methodology. It's a good way of approaching challenges, you try and work out what the challenge type is about. In this case we've got a some kind of an office document. So the first thing to do should be go to have a look at something like office file analysis um, unless you already know exactly how to approach it. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do anyway is unzip the PowerPoint. So you can just unzip this with the standard command and this will give us the whole structure and we can we can basically go now and let's do code well First thing we should probably do is try and grep for hack the box. Um, do it case insensitive and oh, do it recursively as well. Um, we do actually find some, okay, well, let's try and do hack the box with the curly brace and we don't find any. So hack the box, HTB is in there somewhere, case insensitive, but not, not with the flag format. Uh, so yeah, let's open up Codium. Um, we can just do that with the dot to get the whole folder structure. We open this up and this will give us, we can basically just browse through all the different sections now. So um, if you have it set to automatically format files, what I normally do is go in here and hit Control and S and that will quickly give you the, a better format just for going through it. Um, and I essentially went through here just to, through each file to see if there's anything of interest. Uh, I have seen challenges before where there's been data hidden in some of these files. Um, and we can go through, we have our slides, you know, we have our theme, there's a lot of different files we can go through and check here to see what's going on. Uh, we've got our media here as well, we can see some images which are used in the PowerPoint. We can also just go and try and open up the PowerPoint as well, so uh, you might want to do this in Windows if you have like a Windows VM because some macros and things like that will only work on Windows Office, Microsoft Office. Um, in this case we open this up, we've got four slides and it's telling us by just clicking through this presentation our automate systems are hard at work installing system upgrades already um, okay we can go in here to tools macros and have a look and see what macros we have upgrades just go and flick through some of these we have this module one which it looks like then we have some code right in this VBA script so um, there's a few different ways you could approach this. You could try and reverse this manually. You could go and try and run this elsewhere in like a sandbox to try and get the result. Uh, but there are some tools that are available to us to um, to do this as well. So as the hack tricks cheat sheet thing mentioned, we can use some OLE tools. So if you just go and do OLE tab here, you'll see we've got OLE file, ID, map, meta, object, uh, VBA. A lot of different things we could just try. You don't necessarily need to know what all of these do. Just try and run, run them and see what happens. Maybe a flag will pop out. Maybe it'll give you a hint as to what to do. Um, or maybe you'll just get some errors and it won't give you anything. But uh, what I'm looking for here is the OLE VBA or VBA3. I don't know whether it's going to make much of a difference. Uh, if we just try and run that to get our help menu up, we'll see that it can deal with different types of documents and it's going to try to uh, extract and analyze the macros. So you can see here clear text, deobfuscate and analyze malicious macros. So if we just try and run that OLE VBA, let's do OLE VBA3 upgrades. It's going to run through, it's found some suspicious functions and the use of hex strings and stuff like that. It tells us we can use the flag deobf to deobfuscate a bit further. Although 
doesn't really seem to have done too much. We could also use dash dash decode to see all. That's decoded some of the hex, but again, we're not really any closer to getting a flag. So let's go and take a look at another tool. Um, there is a tool called Viper Monkey, which will do some slightly more advanced deobfuscation and analysis of these macros, which we can download and install. So let's go and try this out. Uh, another thing to mention, if you don't have a Windows VM and you want to try and run things dynamically, you can use something like app.any.run sometimes. Okay, that, uh, don't know what happened there. Setting up your web editor. No, thank you. Uh, app.any.run. And you can basically go here and you can just upload a you know a malicious PowerPoint or document or you can provide it a URL or a binary or something like that. You can tell it what operating system you want. You need to register and sign in and stuff. Um, if you don't have a paid account then all of your tasks will be public so be careful about what you upload to it. Um, but yeah I'm not going to run that now. It didn't really provide much uh, output in this case so let's do this uh, Viper Monkey. So I'm going to do uh, git clone cd viper monkey and it's mentioned something here about a docker script install docker and then run okay alright docker monkey sh let's see docker chmod will run docker monkey and then dot dot slash dot dot slash and upgrades dot pptm it's pulling the docker container, it's doing all that stuff for us and now you can see that it's attempting to copy the file into the container the powerpoint dot pptm checking for updates and it's going to go through the analysis. Failed to read metadata. And you can see it's running through here. Let me. Oh. It went through very quickly. Uh, so you can see it's actually executing its call in each of these functions, which were obfuscated. And it's basically de obfuscating as it goes. So you could have a look through here and try and work out what, it's, what it actually did in terms of if you want to try and accomplish this stuff manually. Um, but it runs through we get some information about different functions that are used, heuristics, entry points, etc, username and if we go down to the bottom we'll see that we've decoded seven strings and one of them is the flag and that's how I solve this challenge. I'd be interested to know if anybody used any different tools or if you solved that manually what was your approach to doing it because you know, I very regularly go to these kind of automated tools first of all when trying to de-obfuscate some of these macros so um, I'll be interested to see some other solutions to this one. The next challenge is called the Vault. It's a reversing challenge and the description says, After following a series of tips, you arrived at your destination, a giant vault door. Water drips and steam hisses from the locking mechanism as you examine the small display. Please supply password. Below, a typewriter for you to input. You must study the mechanism hard if you only have one shot. So, we've got a file downloaded already. It is a 64-bit LSB Pi executable. It's not stripped. Sorry, it is stripped, so we're not going to be able to see function names and things like that. Um, let's make it executable and just run it first of all. Try and run it, it just says could not find credentials. You might want to try and run it with Ltrace or something and see if we can see where it's trying to grab the credentials from, but uh, looking pretty obfuscated to me. So let's jump over to Geardra and have a look at the code. So we've got our functions here on the left. There's going to be no main function because it's stripped, so we go to the entry function and this is where we can see the program starting off and it immediately calls us one function then returns so let's take a look at that and we can see this is where the majority of the code is where the majority of the functionality is um, so let's start this from the beginning we have this basic if stream is open and you can see so it's set, we've got here bvar2 is checking to see if the file is open here and if it's not, it's going to come back and say could not find any credentials. So if you go and have a look and see what's actually, what's it trying to open, you see here this address, you double click it and we see here on the left this is flag.txt. So why don't we just go and create a flag.txt, just do touch flag.txt. Let's try and run this again with Ltrace 
and this time we get incorrect credentials anti-intruder sequence activated which you can see down here is where it's jumped to so uh, we'll try and trace our way through this a little bit more let's maybe try and rename some of the variables and stuff so this is making a little bit more sense we uh, I'm going to change this to is file open and okay no what I'm going to change that to is credentials because you can see it was reused down here so this is the credentials which should be opened it's going to make sure that it finds the credentials that's all good and then we have a loop which is here so this is looping up to 19 in hex which is 25 in decimal so this is just like our loop which is looping through each character I guess let's change this to I just because I'm more familiar with seeing that as a as a loop counter um, we also have this 241 which is set to 0 um, where is that used? Okay, so this is looping through. It looks like this is just checking the string length, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to change this to um, str len. So presumably we need to make sure this is 25 characters, otherwise we're going to get that error. I'm going to go back and modify the flag that we have then. So let's just bear in mind what output we have at the moment let's open up flag.txt I'm gonna do we know it's gonna begin with HTB so we'll do that and we'll make this up to 25 characters is that 25 24 alright we'll save that and we'll try and run this again this time we get a lot more output so you can actually see it's gone through the 25 characters that we've input and you can see here this is HTB curly brace and then we've got the A's the 97 in hex so that repeats all the way through and we can see that it's comp each time it's the, the numbers that we've entered are being compared it looks like to these numbers that we have on the left so without really going through the code too much here we, we obviously have uh, a comparison which is being done here between the credentials we enter and what are presumably then the correct creds so I'm going to update that and um, yeah without really looking at this too much we have some stuff going on in here we have a conversion between an int and a uint um, I'm not sure whether I probably didn't get the intended solution on this because what I did try to do here initially was to go and grab these numbers and in fact let me I have these in my notes let me copy and paste these over uh, so I basically try and try to use all these numbers and if we go to something like Cyberchef we can convert these into the ASCII, the raw bytes uh, okay so we're gonna go from decimal and you can see that some of these aren't actually gonna be proper characters so let me save this to flag.txt just gonna save that to downloads and then let's move that to this directory try and run it again and we run through this time you see they all match so the number each time matches what we have there but it's not a sim simple string compare which is being done so it doesn't actually get us a flag it doesn't get us any closer so let's try and reevaluate how we do this I'm guessing the intended solution would have been to work out what you need to input into that flag.txt file in order to make it equal the flag in the output. Um, you know, after the uint to int conversion is done. But that's not how I solved it anyway. Let's have a look at how I went through this. So the other thing we haven't talked about yet is this bvar1 variable we have, which is basically a flag to set to false if any of the credentials, any of the characters don't match what they should be. So I'm going to rename that as correct. You can see here correct is initially set to true. It's going to loop through, check each character in the correct creds versus the creds that are entered in the flag.txt. And if any of them don't match, then we'll get false so that whenever we get to the end of the loop, it's going to say either credentials correct or um, incorrect credentials. So the way I approached this was basically just to check this comparison here. So we can see that each time in a loop it's going to compare the correct credentials to the incorrect ones so if we set a breakpoint up there we'll be able to check each one of those characters and we can see whenever we highlight this on the right in the decompiled code it selects the correct 
address on the disassembled code on the left. So we can actually see that we have a value being moved from the stack into this credentials and then we have another value which is being moved into the ECX. This actually, I didn't really set this up very well because this isn't actually the correct creds here. The correct creds are being moved into the ECX I believe. But we'll go and, we'll go and check this out anyway. So we could set up a breakpoint. We don't want to set up a breakpoint. Uh, well, we could set up a breakpoint there. I'm going to set up a breakpoint here where it actually does the comparison between credentials and ECX. And ECX is going to be our correct cred. So I'm going to take a copy of this. And let's go over to. I'm going to open this up in GDB Pwn Debug. We can't. Um, because it's stripped. Let's go info functions. Uh, not because it's stripped, because we don't have the function, we don't have the full addresses because pi is enabled. So each time the program loads, it'll have a different address, but the offsets will always be the same to the functions. So in terms of what we grabbed there, let's try and we can use something called break RVA, which will, uh, we can provide an offset. So in this case, we wanted that offset right here, the C, C3A1. And if we say break RVA and 0x, paste that in, it's not going to allow us to set it at the moment because the program needs to be running. It needs to find out what these offsets are first of all. I think, let me try and just run it first of all and then do that again. Now we still need to start it. So I'm going to do start i to start the first instruction. I'm going to do that again. We'll get our breakpoint. Let's just hit continue. We hit continue, it gets to our breakpoint. You can see here now it's got the actual full address of it. It's comparing the EAX to the ECX. And we can go here and see what we actually have. So we have our RAX, we have our RCX. You can see the RAX. Let me try and print RAX. You see there it's quite a big value. But if we do EAX, we actually get minus 32. So I guess this is to do with the UIN and INT conversion that we had there. I remember saying maybe the correct or the intended solution was to try and um, you know account for that conversion, but I'm not too sure. But uh, we don't actually need to do that because we know that the ECX is has the value that we're actually comparing, right? So we can do p ECX, and that has 72 in it. Let's hit continue again. Do the same thing. We've got an 84. Let's hit continue again. Same thing. 66. And these are basically the values of our flag, right? If you go to from decimal 86, sorry, not 86, what was that? 66 is B. So we had HTB there. We can do again, continue, print it one more time, one, two, three. So we should be expecting to see a curly brace, which we do. Uh, and we can basically keep going through in this fashion and get in each character of the ECX, so 118 is a V. Again, continue, P ECX 116. It's a bit of a tedious process here, kind of semi-manually running through that. Uh, but if we keep going in this fashion, we will get our entire flag. What I'm going to do is just copy over the values so let me paste these in. So this was the flag here, HTB, Vtables are cool, Vtables. Uh, so if we go here and keep doing the same thing, let me actually keep that open in the background, you can kind of see it a little bit. Um, next was our 98, which you can see here, 98, continue, and again, 108, 51, and yeah, we get through each element of the flag. So yeah, I'm going to be really interested to see how other people solve this one. I feel like I didn't really solve it as intended, but maybe I'm wrong. The next challenge is called Slippy. It's a web challenge and the description says, you found a portal for a firmware upgrade service responsible for the deployment and maintenance of rogue androids hunted humans outside the tractor city. The question is, what are you going to do about it? We've got a server to connect to and some files to download. so. Let's go and get things working locally first of all. We've got a docker script here, so we'll do build docker. And while that's running, let's open this up in Codium. And let's take a look at the code. So we can take a look at the docker file. 
just to get an idea, I mean we can see here that it's a Flask application. Um, we can see here that Python don't write bytecode is set. Disable PyCache. I'm not too sure how relevant that is for us. Um, we've got a config here as well. Again, sometimes interesting. You can sometimes see, for example, what logs are available. So if there's like a log poisoning challenge or something like that. Uh, but the main part of the code is here in the challenge section. We've got a run.py, which is just launching the application. We've got a flag here, a fake flag for testing. And let's start off at main.py. We've got some blueprints registered here. We've got API. Let's actually, let's while this is, while we're going through it, just so it makes a bit more, so we can compare the visuals with the code. Uh, let's go and have a look here. So open this up. We've got current slippy jet version is 3.03. .03. Please select a new version of, of firmware as a tar.gz file, gunzip, to upload. So we need to select a file to upload and we know that there was an API there. Let's try and access it. Not found, okay. Don't really need to look at the source because we have the full source code. So let's go and take another look through here. So we have config.py we can see an upload folder is being set, so obviously the files are uploaded. This is the upload directory. We've got a secret key being generated. Go into util. So this is where the main stuff is happening that we're interested in. We can see we've got uh, one function in here which is called extract from archive. It's going to take in a file and as we can see here it's going to make sure it's a tar file. Return true if the name points to a tar archive that we're able to handle. It's going to make sure it's using gunzip as well, so we need to be aware of that. And then it's going to set an extract directory which is going to be in the upload folder which we saw was previously defined but it's also going to use this generate function here which is just going to get uh, 15 bytes of hex, random hex. Um, we can see that down here it's also going to loop through then it's going through the tar archive and getting the extracted files out there and it's going to return that to us. It's basically going to return a list of the files that we have inside of that and then it's going to close it. Um, see if we have anything else interesting here. We've got our index.html, not really. We can see this is the archives folder. Some JavaScript, probably not of much interest to us in this case. And we have our roots here. Okay, so this is where uh, we make a post request to unslippy and that's going to uh, call extract from archive with the tar file that we provide and then if it returns a list of files i.e. the files that were extracted uh, we'll get the 200 OK with a list of those files. So first thing we'll do is just test out the normal functionality. So if we go and create a file let's just say touch I'm gonna I'll show, what something I actually tried to do was to try and create a file that does like 7 times 7 to see if there's like SSTI server side template injection but um, if you look at the code, it's never actually, it doesn't call render template on the output anywhere, so it wasn't really important. It wasn't really w um, likely to do anything, but let's just do it anyway. We create that as a file, and then we'll say tar. We need to make sure we use the gunzip czvf. And we'll just create this, we'll call it flag tar.gz and pass in this file that we just created. So if we try to upload this it's going to come back with our extracted list and then it just gives us the option to download it. Actually what was interesting, you can see there if we highlight that as well, we have the random value or those random hex values in, in the archives direct directory but if we weren't sure to how to approach this challenge, a good thing to do would be to go and search something like tar, upload, exploit, some keywords relating to the challenge that we're trying to solve. And just go through, we have some, uh, this is actually interesting, there was a recent Hack the Box challenge, I'll not spoil which one it is, but um, that made use of some of the some of the techniques in here, but it's not related to this challenge. Um, we might have to scroll down a little bit. For some reason, for some reason Google just always gives me better results. 
Let's have a look. Yeah, uh, this was an article I found which talks about zip slip and the name of the challenge is Slippy. I've got a file upload here, Slippy Jet version, which so that would kind of make sense. It says uh, in this article, we'll walk through two of the most exploited vulnerabilities involving zip files. Obviously, we're using a tar.gz file, so things might be slightly different. Or they might not be if we can find some tool that deals with all of them. Um, and in terms of some exploits, this goes through a couple of examples. But essentially, if we can use a file name which has um, directory traversal in it and try and traverse back, we can potentially do some kind of exploit that way. Uh, the second technique that they go through here is using symlinks, so setting up a shortcut to another file. Uh, this is what I was trying initially actually before I looked into the, these techniques um, but whenever I did did that whenever I used any of these techniques here it would it would not allow me to upload the file whenever you upload it it would say it was an invalid zip zip file uh, I'd be interested to see if anybody else got anything working that way but um, let me jump over to a tool that I found which helped with this okay so it's called evil arc there's probably various tools. Uh, this was developed 11 years ago and it still works pretty well here. As we can see, um, EvilArc lets you create a zip file that contains files with directory traversal characters in their embedded path because we can't simply do that in our command line. You can't just create a file with dot dot slash in it. Um, if we try to do that, let me try like... Um, You see, we'll get okay. We get permission denied. But let's try. Um, it's created it, but it's basically created it back in the directories. It's created it like in my home directory there. So let me remove that. Okay, but yeah, that's the point anyway. We can't just easily create the file name through the terminal. Um, however, as it says, we can um, do this through a script basically. So let's grab the Python script. Uh, it's 2011, so presumably not going to be Python 3. And okay, that's not what we wanted to do. And you can see that it deals with different file types as well. It's going to be able to do our GZ file. Um, it also has some different options in terms of uh, the platform, so you can set it to, let's see the options here. Uh, well, let's actually, we'll try and run it and then, oh, Python 2, incorrect arguments, okay. Uh, well, the options here anyway, we can specify we can specify the operating system dash O. So obviously we're gonna. It says it defaults to Windows, so we're gonna make sure we need to specify that as Unix. Um, we set our path as well. We have the depth, which is by default eight, which is not necessarily what we'll want, and the output and the input files and stuff. So let's try it out. And what I'm gonna try and do is, if we go to our back to our directory here. Um, we can try and overwrite one of these files. So let's try and overwrite um, run.py. We can we can overwrite any of them, but any of those Python ones. But um, we'll set our depth to four, and then dash o u for Unix, dash f for our file name, which we can just set as new. I'll do it as flag actually, because I want to overwrite the old one. Um, and then the file. Oh, actually, we need to also just create a file. So I'm just going to touch run.py, create an empty file. Hopefully, it'll break the program and then we know things are working as they should. So you can see that creates that. It's created it with this file name. Let's go and try to upload it. You can see here run.py. We click it, we get run.py, we get connection reset go back here and refresh the page, we've got connection reset, go and have a look at our docker and we can see here detected change in app run.py reloading. So we've just overwritten 
run.py with nothing and crash the server. Um, so that's good. Obviously, we need to restart the server now, but we know that we can overwrite that, and that's a step forward to trying to get some code execution so that we can read the flag. Uh, this was rel relatively simple, but it did take me a while. Like, I was kind of putting the overwriting some different files and different things in the files before I got something to work, but um, it's relatively simple. How I got here in the end was at util.py, whenever we upload an art. Um, uh, an archive to extract. It's going to return our extracted file names, but we know that it's important OS already. So, if we were to go and update this, let me. We don't want to update that one. We want to update um, a malicious one here. Let's do codium util .py. Uh, Also, whenever I was trying to, I had the name as utils.py for for a good 10 or 20 minutes. And I kept uploading a file and wondering why it wasn't working. It's because I was overwriting, well, I was writing utils instead of util.py. Um, but okay, yeah, let's, uh, because it's already got OS, let's go here and say instead of returning extracted file names, do return uh, os.systemls. I'm going to save that. And we're going to run the same thing again. I'm going to change that to util. And I'm going to change the depth to 3 because this is one directory up. Uh, we run through that. We'll upload it. And we get a message saying make sure it's valid. Let's refresh the page. Let's actually go back and have a look at our docker. Not looking good. I'm going to try that again. Ah, this time it worked, okay. We go back to our docker, still nothing interesting. But we've only just overwritten util.py. So we actually, in order to trigger this again, we need to upload another file. So I'm going to upload the same thing again. Could not be uploaded. But if we go over here and have a look, you see it's actually listed out the files in the directory. So we know we've got code execution. We can now say we want to get the flag. But if we cap the flag.txt, it's just going to print out on the server, which we're not going to see whenever we test this remotely. So something we can do is try to copy it over to a, a directory that we can access. For example, static. So let's go and modify the code slightly. And instead of listing, we're going to say cat, no, we're going to say copy flag to um, application slash static. We know it's application because we can see here application. We've got static, which is just typically a writable directory. And if we save that, run this again, upload the file again, we not we're not going to get any output there. But let's try and access slash static slash flag and we didn't get it. Okay, one second. Let's try and upload that again. Could not be uploaded this time. Oh. Static flag still not found. What did I miss? Copy flag to application static util py oh um okay i know i, I know what's going on we need to restart the server don't we because we've we we changed the server to not actually upload files anymore it's just going to return the it's going to return OS system. It's not going to execute any of this code anymore. Um, there's probably a far better way to do that. We don't really need to return, I guess. We can just call OS system and just carry on doing the file upload. But oh well, this is the last time we're going to do it. I'm just going to I'm just going to leave it as is. Let's try it one more time. Upload. Upload. And let's try and access static slash flag gives us an option to download it, that's great, so we can download it and we can go and have a look at it. But we I think we should be able to just go and have a look at it in 
uh, in burp, maybe, no? Oh, it doesn't show in burp. Oh, wait. Interesting. Okay, uh, well, it doesn't really matter now, does it? Let's cut out downloads, flag. We've got our fake flag for testing, so everything's working as it should do. Let's go and test it out remotely. Grab the server and the port number. Just go ahead and upload this same payload. And again, let's go static slash flag. Awesome. Save that. And then we'll just do the same thing. This time we need to cut out the second one. Oh, what am I doing? Um, backslash <laughs> two. There we go. I slipped my way to RCE. Um, and one thing to mention, if you come across challenges like this and you haven't done that type of exploit before, you haven't come across that type of vulnerability, uh, as very, very often happens to me, um, although I was able to find some uh, some documentation on ZipSlip and stuff like that, if you also just search for ZipSlip CTF right up, um, you'll find good examples. I think that's quite often a better way to get an understanding than just looking through kind of articles and stuff about it. This one on Secjuice was really good and used pretty much the same technique that I used in that example in terms of overwriting the run.py. It's using zip instead of a instead of a tar file but most of it was pretty similar. They used also exec and server-side template injection in it. Uh, but just something worth, worth mentioning. The next challenge is called Arachnoid Heaven it's a pwn challenge and the description says in the steam world you need some trustworthy companions to help continue your journey what's better than a handmade top tier state of the art arachnoid machine exactly nothing come to the arachnoid heaven and craft yours as soon as possible so we've got a server to connect to we've also got a file to download let's go and take a look at it we can check the file type first of all and we'll see that it's a 64-bit lsb pi executable so each time the program loads it's going to have some different addresses, we'll just need to bear that in mind if we're setting up breakpoints and stuff like that. It's not stripped so we'll be able to see the function names and stuff this time. But uh, let's try and make it executable. And we'll try and run it. We'll also run checksec as well since it's a pwn challenge, we'll see what protections are enabled on the binary. In this case we've got basically everything enabled, it's um, fully protected. So um, we're not going to be injecting shellcode on the stack to execute. Uh, if we do have a buffer overflow, we would need to worry about making sure we don't overwrite the canary with a invalid value, so we'd need to like leak the canary and overwrite it with the correct one. Uh, we're not going to be able to overwrite entries in the global offset table, and as I mentioned, pi is enabled, so each time the program loads, it's going to have slightly different uh, addresses. Uh, that's fine, let's try and run the program, see what happens. We've got some options to craft, delete, view, and obtain arachnoid. So we could just try and go through some of these and see what happens. We can enter in a name there. You'll see that it actually ran over the allowed length. So it went. Uh, it actually took some of those A's as another option. We can try and delete that. We can try and view them. You can see that we have an interesting code there. Let's actually try and open, let's try and add a new one. View the arachnoids. Okay, so these both have, oh, this one has a code of bad, okay. And then we have an option to obtain as well. We'll just select an index of one of them and then we get unauthorized. Okay, so we're gonna to want to go and analyze this a little bit more. Let's go and take a look at Geardra. So over in Geardra, we'll take a look at our functions on the left. They're not stripped, so we can go straight to the main function. And we'll see that we have, first of all, we've got this setup, which is being called. And the setup's gonna set up some things. So you can see it's actually setting up an alarm with FF in it, so 255. So this is going to basically mean that if we're running the program in a debugger or if we're just running it to test it out, after a while it's going to set off this alarm and just close the program. So what I'm going to do, even just before we jump through the code, let's go and patch that out. I do have a patch binary script here in my pwn directory. You can grab this on the GitHub or you can just type it out. There's not really too much to grab to be honest, but 
copy that here. Let's open it up in Codium. And this binary, it's just a, at the moment, it's just like a little template here. You can see it's going to open up a binary in this case. Let's get the file name. It's going to open it up and then it's going to patch out. In this case, it's patching out ptrace, which will stop you, which in some of the challenges, if ptrace is being checked, it'll basically just check to see whether you're running inside of a debugger. And if it will, then it might just exit the program. So sometimes you want to patch that out. In this case, we're going to patch out the alarm. And we're just basically saying replace the alarm with a ret instruction. So just return instead of instead of doing that. And that's it. We can just literally run Python patch binary. It creates this patch. So we're going to move patch to patch to arachnoid heaven. Make that executable. And now we can run this again. This is basically the same, but it just doesn't have that alarm in it. So we can leave it running as long as we want without it crashing. Uh, and that out of the way, let's go and have a look at the code. So let's leave this setup function. Let's go back to the main function. So in terms of our functionality here, we've got a message being printed out to welcome us. We've got a piece of code which basically says if we don't enter one, two, three, four, or five, it's going to exit. And we've got our main menu options, craft, delete, view, and obtain. So let's go and take a look at craft first of all. We go in here and we can see, first of all, we can see some malloc calls here. So I'm going to give a quick disclaimer that I'm terrible with anything related to the heap. And my explanations here probably won't be as good as some of my uh, stack buffer overflows and stuff, which I have a bit of a better understanding of. But uh, I'll do my best anyway. Let's see how it goes. We've got a canary here. So what I'm going to do is just instantly as we go through, let's rename some of these variables so that we can kind of try to understand what everything's doing. We have a malloc which is being called here with 16 bytes, and another one with 40 bytes, and another one with 40 bytes. And then these are being assigned to new locations. We have a read here, so it's asking us for the name, and it reads in 20 bytes. So this is just in hex, you can either go over, you can go over to the left and just highlight that and it'll say what it is in decimal, 20. Or you can calculate it from the hex. So from hex, from base 16, we have 4 plus 1 times 16, which is 20. And then with these, we have 8 plus 2 times 16, which is 40. So if it's not a big hex number, it's easy enough to just convert in, in your head. Um, but as soon as we know that this is what's reading in the name, I'm going to instantly rename that to name. And again, we can it changes the variables in a few places so we can kind of see what's going on a little bit better. We can also see here string copy is being done from default code into name one. And name one down here is assigned to this PV var one. So I'm going to change that as well to code because we know that's where the code's being moved to. We can also see this is the count. So I'm going to change that to count. And I think that's changed everything. I think that's basically all the variables we're interested in. So let's just try and run through that again. We've got some malloc's being called. A malloc is being done for a code. A malloc's being done for, uh, sorry, for name, first of all, we had that of 10, so 16 bytes. We have the malloc being done for code. We have another malloc being called there after the name is set as a pointer to code. We have name one being set to code. All right, so some of this is a little bit hard for me to follow. We don't really need to understand everything that's going on with the code, luckily, because otherwise I'd very rarely solve any challenges. Um, as long as we can identify what the important bits are, that's all good. So our new entries added anyway, our new arachnoid, and we get the index returned to us, and it increments the count. Let's go and we'll jump. We'll come back to this later. Let's go and jump into the next function. Uh, let me go back to main here. Go back to main. Let's take a look at delete. So, again, we could go and set some of these up. We've got our canary here. We can, it's going to read in the index, which is going to be this local 12. I'm going to update that and say index. And this is just updating that as well. So, index times 0x80. That was, if, uh, I'm not going to go back, but the 0x80 was in our last. Uh, function is like the offset, the size, I guess. Um, it's going to print out the 
index that we selected, the name and the code. And if it's not a valid index, it's going to say invalid. Otherwise, it's going to call free, first of all, on the name. And then secondly, on the code, which we know was eight bytes after from that code that we were on previously. Let me just jump back to create, to craft. See, remember we had this, um, uh, <laughs> uh, we had this set 0x80 is the name and then plus 8 was the code. We go back there again and that's exactly what's happening here. It's freeing those. So um, we've got a potential use after free vulnerability here whereby we're able, where malloc's being called, it's then being freed and then we can go and recreate something. So let me just grab a link. As I say, I'm not, I'm not particularly good with these kind of exploits so let's have a look at um, some information on it so uh, use after free once free is called an allocation the allocator is free to reallocate the chunk of memory in future calls to malloc if it so chooses however if the program author isn't careful and uses the free object later on the contents may be corrupt or even attacker controlled this is called a use after free or UAF and we've got a simple example here. You can go and take a look at this or some other examples as well. But let's jump back over to our code and see how we can take advantage of this. Let's just go and see what else we had in terms of functions. We, we've had a look at our craft and delete. Let's take a look at view. And there's nothing much of interest here. We can rename this again. We can set up our canary. Um, so our canary, this is what's stopping us from overflowing the buffer as well. If we were to overflow the buffer, if there was a buffer overflow, then we would need to make sure that this canary isn't overwritten with a new value because you can see down here before we return which is where the buffer overflow would happen it's going to check to see that the canary still equals what it equaled at the beginning so if we overwrite everything on the stack then it won't equal that um, but yeah that's not related to this challenge anyway let's keep going we've got this local 1c I'm going to change that to i just because I'm used to seeing loops with an i index and this doesn't really matter, we're just going to loop through each of the arachnoids um, and print them out, so not too much going on there. Uh, and finally we have obtain, so instantly we'll see this cat flag.txt, so we know this is where we need to go. Um, let's go and have a look through this. We've got our canary, we have the index here, so it's saying invalid index, so let's change that to index. And we have a string compare then, so it's going to compare the 0x80 plus 8, so the index we provide is going to that index and then it's going to 0x80 plus 8 which if we remember was the code not the name, so there's a name and there's a code and it's comparing it to Spidey, so you can see here six. it's going to compare six characters, let me just highlight that the EAX is the return and then we have in the RDI we have our first string, we have our second string in the RSI and then we have the number of characters we want to compare in the RDX uh, and if the index is zero, it's going to come back cat flag.txt, otherwise it's going to come back unauthorized. So we need to make sure that the code equals Spidey. So let's go and let's we can go through in GDB here and set up some breakpoints and stuff and try and get a better idea of what's going on in the background. So pi is enabled here, so we want to get the offset of this string compare. You can see it's right here, 163C. I'm going to take a copy of that. I'm going to go back over here. Let's do GDB, Pwn Debug, Arachnid, Arachnoid, sorry. And we can have a look at our functions here. If we wanted to go and disassemble any in here, we could do to try and get some addresses as well. For example, that Obtain Arachnoid. We could go in here to find the same address. But um, let's do Break RVA 0x. It's not going to work because it's not being run, so let's do start i to start in the first instruction. We'll do that again, break RVA, and we'll hit continue. And now we want to try, and well, let's just, first of all, let's go to obtain arachnoid, and we'll say zero. It's going to say invalid because we haven't created one. Let's craft one. And what was the name it wanted? It wanted it to be spidey. Um, but that's what we want the code to be. So let's run that. You'll see we've got spidey arachnoid index. Let's have a look if we now view them we'll see that it's arachnoid and the code is bad. Now if we go to obtain for set zero as the index, we're going to hit this breakpoint and immediately you see we have bad and we have spidey. 
um, we could go up here and have a look at the actual parameters. So this was the string and compare. So it's comparing six characters from bad and from Spidey. So from these two locations. Obviously these don't match, so that's where our problem is going to be. But because of this potential, this use after free vulnerability we have there, what we should be able to do here is try to delete this first one. And let's go and craft a new one. And now I'm going to call this one Spidey. Now let's view. And look at this, we've got an arachnoid with the name bad and the code Spidey. Which is exactly what you wanted. So let's go ahead and create a fake flag because we know it's going to cat flag.txt. Fake flag to flag.txt. Let's go to obtain, and it's the zeroth element. Um, it's comparing Spidey and Spidey, so you know that we've done the right thing. We hit continue. It didn't actually print the flag there, but I think this is just like a GDB thing. Let me go. Let's try that manually. So we'll craft one. I'm just going to not call it anything. I'm going to delete that first one. I'm going to craft a new one and I'm going to call it Spidey. And I'm going to view. And there we've got our first one is is called bad with the code Spidey rather than the other way around. So now if we go to obtain, enter in the zero element and we get back fake flag. So now it's just going to be a case of running it against the server, but let's just try and understand a little bit better what happened there. Well, I'm going to explain it how I understand it anyway. I might be I might be wrong on this. Somebody can correct me in the comments if I am. But as far as I'm aware, whenever we go to this delete, it's first calling free on the name. You remember it did two separate mallocs, one for the name and one for the code. It calls free on the name. It calls free on the malloc. Uh, sorry, not free on the malloc. It calls free on the free on the name and then free on the code. And as far as I'm aware, because that's the last thing that was freed. Whenever we then go back to craft, it'll reuse that chunk. That it'll basically put the name, which is the first thing that we enter, in the same address as what as where the code was previously, because that was the last thing that was freed. So whenever we type in the name, it's actually pointing to where the code should be. Hopefully that makes sense. It probably doesn't because I, I don't understand this stuff particularly well myself, so I'm probably not explaining it as well as um as somebody could do, but uh, let's go and test it out anyway. See if we can get this working on the remote server. It should just be the same case as it was testing it locally. Grab the server and the port number. Let me minimize this so you can see it a little better. Connect this with Netcat. And we're going to craft. We're going to delete. Let's view again. You can see we view that and it's actually messed up the code. Let's go and craft a new one and let's set it to Spidey. Let's view again. Everything's looking good. We've got a arachnoid with the name bad and the code Spidey. Go to obtain, zero with element, and we get back our flag. And that's going to wrap it up with this video. As you can see, we've still got a bit of time left on the CTF, but I probably won't have time to get through many of the challenges tomorrow and I want to check out the new Hack the Box machine that was released tonight. Uh, I've also got to go through and edit this video which takes me a little while to hopefully get most of the microphone pops out of the audio. Uh, but I hope you've enjoyed the video anyway, give it a like, subscribe and all that and um, I recently put up some resources on my GitHub, I have all the scripts and stuff from CTF competitions and Hack the Box challenges and things like that on there and I've just added some good sites for doing capture the flags and uh, hacking boxes and stuff like that. Some good content creators to subscribe to. I'm really hoping we'll see some videos from John Hammond on the harder challenges that I didn't get solved and even on the challenges I did solve because I'm sure he'll solve them in a different way. I'll probably explain them better. I'm also hoping that they'll release these full poem boxes and hopefully Al Hazard will go through them on his live streams. I've put up his YouTube channel here but he really streams on Twitch and just uploads some of the videos but as much as I love watching Ipsec and XCT, Ipsec's always got a great 
in-depth walkthrough and XCT just gives you everything you need to know in as short a time as possible but uh, I've been really enjoying the Twitch streams anyway, I highly recommend them. Uh, but yeah, that'll wrap it up for this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. Thanks.